Hello, my friends. This is David C. Drake, the Golden Drake, and welcome to Daggerfall Unity, a beautiful rebuild of this classic and feature-rich action RPG, The Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall. This will be my first full playthrough of any version of Daggerfall. I did play a little bit of the original version back in the day, and um, this Unity version thankfully does fix a lot of the bugs and also provides various visual enhancements, gameplay enhancements, uh, various options you can toggle when you first start the game. It also opens the door to a lot more modding capability. So I have installed uh, several mods, not a ton. You know, I don't like to go too heavy with mods, but uh, one of those very popular mods, it's actually kind of a set of mods, is the one that you see labeled down here, Dream. It provides, um, most notably, uh, a lot of fantastic visual enhancements. Now, the original pixelated goodness of The Elder Scrolls Daggerfall is also nice in its own way. And so I would definitely say uh, the Dream mod is not um, necessary or essential, you know, if you want to stick with the original kind of pixely look of original Daggerfall, that's perfectly fine. Uh, it will still be enhanced in various ways by this Unity engine. But I have decided that I do like the look of the enhancements provided by Dream. And other parts of this collection of mods include enhancements to music, sound effects, and uh, certain other things. And I have also installed a handful of other mods that further enhance the graphics uh, or that enhance the gameplay in certain ways. I'll describe that a bit more later on. Um, I will also be sharing some tips some Elder Scrolls lore now and then, um, a little bit of game design analysis, and perhaps some trivia. First things first, let's go ahead and dive into character creation by starting a new game. Please select your home province. Now, I already have a very specific character build in mind. This character will be a Red Guard from Hammerfell. Red Guards hail from the province of Hammerfell. You are part of a dark-skinned people, extremely hardy and quick. Legend has it that the Red Guard are innately more proficient with weaponry than any other race. In general, Red Guards make excellent warriors. Is your character to be a Red Guard? Yes. Now, I do want to note just briefly, uh, if some of you are kind of thinking right now, especially if you're kind of new to the Elder Scrolls series, if you're kind of thinking, I feel like there's some sort of real world uh, racial stereotypes going on here. You know, that is a very interesting topic. There's a lot to be said about that sort of thing when it comes to a lot of fantasy game franchises, frankly. Uh, I'm not going to get too heavy into that today, but I might discuss it more at some point. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on. Select that character's gender, male. Would you like to choose from the list of possible classes to play? You can also create your own custom character class by choosing this option. I love how the uh, question mark seems to be put in the wrong place here. Or would you like to generate your character's class by answering 10 questions to determine the class most compatible to you? Some people consider this to be kind of fun. I've always preferred to either choose my own class or create my own custom class. And for this game in particular, virtually everyone agrees that creating your own custom class is the best option in this game. So that's what we're going to do. We're gonna go ahead and scroll past all these options that you see here and choose custom. Now, there's a lot to talk about here. First of all, let's name this class. Oops. <laughs> Sword Singer. Sword Singers are significant in the lore and cultural backdrop of the Red Guards. I might get into that a little bit more later, but basically, they're just a special group of warriors that are extremely adept with swords, obviously, and also tend to have some degree of magical ability, or at least seem to, in terms of just how incredibly adept they are in combat. Moving on. Let's look at this right here, skill advancement for class. We have a dagger here pointing at average. Now, depending on what changes we make, especially to max hit points per level and special advantages and special disadvantages, this dagger may move up into this difficult region or down toward this easy region in terms of how quickly skills will advance for my character. So we're going to want to watch that carefully I don't mind if it goes a little bit into the difficult range, but we don't want it to go too far up. So let's go ahead and change the max hit points per level. We're going to see that the dagger moves up. The more we move this up, the maximum is 30. What this actually means is whenever you level up, you will have a base hit point increase between half of this value and this value. So it would be between 15 and 30. Uh, there is also a bonus potentially provided by endurance. If you have a high endurance, it might provide an extra one, two, or more 
hit points per level. Now I'm going to go ahead and leave this at 20. I feel pretty good about that. And we're going to add a couple of special advantages for this character. I want to add athleticism. Unfortunately, it doesn't give you descriptions here about what these do. You'll have to look that up online. I highly recommend checking out the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages, uesp.net, and there's just a wealth of fantastic information there. Athleticism primarily reduces fatigue loss while running, climbing, swimming, etc. Uh, it also increases jump height, jump distance. So uh, this character is very athletic. Also is very gifted when it comes to magic. So we're going to choose increased majory, three times intelligence in spell points. You can see now the dagger is moving significantly toward this difficult region where skills will advance more slowly. There are other options here. As you can see, feel free to look up what each of these do and what types of uh, more specific options they have. So for example, if you chose rapid healing, you would see you could choose it just in general or only in darkness or only in light. You know, there are some interesting options here, but for my character, I'm just going to stick with these two. And now to get this dagger closer to average, I'm also going to add some special disadvantages. I want my character to have a couple of forbidden armor types. That will be leather and chain. Typically in role-playing games, I actually kind of dislike this sort of thing because it's unrealistic, right? Like there's no reason why any person should truly be forbidden from just wearing some leather or chain. But uh, in my case, I would consider this from sort of a role play perspective, maybe my character not only has a certain distaste for lighter forms of armor, but maybe he even has kind of a superstition about it. Like he feels like it will uh, make him unlucky in combat if he's wearing that type of armor. Anyway, I'm also going to add a low tolerance to poison. And I'm going to add a forbidden weapon, axe. So again, whether you consider this just a very strong preference or maybe even a superstition, or maybe it's based on some negative experiences in his past, uh, he has a strong distaste for using axes in combat. My character also has a certain phobia toward Daedra, which frankly I think is very understandable. And what this means is he will have a slightly lower chance to hit when he's facing Daedra. I'm not too concerned about this, but we'll see. Who knows? I might end up regretting this a little bit. But the other thing is, when facing Daedric enemies, uh, they will have a higher chance to hit him. So, that may make things interesting. Going along with that, this character also has a forbidden material, Daedric. Some people might scoff at my choosing to disallow my character from using any Daedric armor or weapons. Uh, you know, they might think that's horrible, but for me, I don't think it's that big of a deal. And I like the way that this ties into sort of my concept for this character. He has a strong distaste for Daedric items and the way that they're typically created or originated. And he just has a general distaste for Daedra. He doesn't necessarily... Uh, have like a burning hatred for them entirely. He recognizes that uh, they might sometimes have good effects in the world. It's not always 100% against his personal code to have any dealings with some Daedra, but nonetheless, he is kind of scared of them, kind of wary of them, not a big fan of Daedra. I think this is all we're going to add in terms of disadvantages. So we can see here the dagger, it's gotten a little bit closer to average skill advancement speed. Let's go ahead and exit. Now, we could make changes to the starting values for each of these attributes. I think you have to end up balancing them. So if you want to add to one, you have to subtract from another. Some people are very opinionated about which attributes they consider truly important in this game or unimportant. I think they all have their place and it kind of depends on your play style and what sort of role playing you have in mind for your character. For mine, I'm going to go ahead and for now leave them all at the average of 50. You know, I consider this character to be pretty well rounded. Some of these are going to be increased in the near future based on random values as you'll see shortly. And I'll also get a certain number of bonus points that I can add as I choose. Now, 
there are two remaining things for me to do. I need to decide on my primary, major, and minor skills. I also need to edit my reputations if I wish to. Let's go ahead and do that real quick. Now this is another area where things need to balance out. So let's say I feel like my character has a little bit of reputation in the world, and it's mostly a positive reputation with merchants and peasants and scholars and nobility. So now I have four points I've added. Now I need to subtract four points from something. So that will be the underworld. This would sort of include various different criminal types, uh, ranging from good criminals to evil criminals. So anyway, let's go ahead and say that this will be my default starting point for my character. How about skills? One thing to note here, leveling up is determined by how many skill points you have in all three of your primary skills, the two highest of your major skills, and the one highest of your minor skills. So the primary skills matter most. First primary skill I'm going to choose, naturally, is Longblade. The second I'm going to go with is dodging. And this includes dodging weapons as well as spells. I'm also going to choose Critical Strike. I kind of had mixed feelings about this at first, but I've decided I do like the idea of having this as one of my primary skills. Critical Strike adds to your chance to hit with physical weapons, and I believe that is its only effect. I don't think it has any effect on how much damage you deal, but of course if you're hitting more often then you're dealing more damage per second. And one thing that's great about these two skills here, they will be checked automatically on a regular basis just by naturally playing the game. I won't need to do anything special to advance these. And Longblade, also the only special thing I need to do is often have a Longblade equipped and use it. Uh, so these three will be advancing steadily throughout the game. So that will really help in terms of leveling efficiently. For my major skills, these are very important as well. This character's number one uh, major skill will be Restoration. This character is gifted, as I mentioned, when it comes to magic in addition to combat, especially with Restoration magic. That could be in part a sort of compensation for the fact that he does have some weakness to poison, and later when I go through answering some background questions, uh, I believe I may choose to give my character a little bit of weakness to contracting diseases as well. So you could say there's a little bit of a chicken or egg thing going on there, like could it be that my character, despite being very physically fit, is a little bit weak to poison and disease because maybe he has relied a little too heavily on restoration magic instead of relying on his natural immune system and so forth? Or is it that he naturally had those weaknesses basically from birth and it's just a happy coincidence that he is gifted in restoration magic to help compensate for that? Either way, that's the way things are. We're also going to add archery here, and stealth. Stealth is another skill that will naturally increase automatically without me having to do anything special, because although this game does have a key you can press to go into stealth mode, so to speak, that just means you're trying to be extra stealthy. But even when you're just walking normally or even running, uh, the stealth skill is still checked to see how quickly enemies in the area may or may not detect you. So stealth will be increasing steadily, basically no matter how I play. Archery, of course, will only increase if I'm using bows and arrows a lot. I probably will. It's possible that I might neglect that to some extent, but even if that's the case, I know I'm not going to neglect restoration too much. So as long as restoration and stealth are advancing very steadily, then that's all that matters because only the top two of these skills will contribute to my leveling efficiency. Now, minor skills. Only one of these will contribute to my leveling at any given time, you know, whichever one happens to be the highest, but whatever I choose here, it will also increase my skill in that area. Major skills are increased a little bit more, primary skills are increased the most, so of course, what you choose here does help determine how good your character is right from the get-go in certain aspects of the game. Now I'm first and foremost going to choose all the other schools of magic, starting with mysticism. And then we'll go with thaumaturgy. The order here actually probably doesn't matter, I just want to have it in a certain order, that's all. Alteration. And destruction and illusion. 
What final skill should I choose? Well, we're definitely not going to choose axe, right? Backstabbing is not something my character is very interested in, nor is blunt weapon. Now, what the heck is centaurian, or daedric, dragonish, giantish, etc.? These are language skills. It's not used extensively in the game, unless you install mods that make it have additional uses. But uh, by default, basically what these language skills mean is it gives you a chance to be able to effectively communicate with that enemy type if they're in your area and pacify them, convince them not to fight you. That can be useful sometimes. I'm not going to choose one of those as a minor skill, however. Now what else do we have here? Climbing. That can be kind of nice. You know, climbing is a cool feature in this game. Etiquette refers to when you're in dialogue with nobility in particular, where you might choose a more polite way of speaking. That will rely on your etiquette skill. Hand to hand. Harpy and Impish are a couple more language skills. We have jumping here. Lock picking. Medical. That increases how much you heal per hour of resting. Mercantile. Nymph. Orcish. These are a couple more language skills. At this point in the Elder Scrolls series, orcs are still not a playable race. However, I should mention that in this game there are some orcs that you can interact with as peaceful NPCs. So there is at least that. That is something that did not exist in Arena. Pickpocket, running, short blade. This is the one I'm going to choose because I believe my sword singer he should be very adept not only with long blades, but also short blades. Spriggan is another language skill. We have Streetwise, another dialogue skill that is used when speaking with more common folk, using a more blunt form of speech. And we have Swimming. So let's choose short blade, and I think we're good to go. Would you like to fast start by automatically generating your character's background? You will be able to adjust starting attributes and skills within the character sheet or choose your character's career path by answering 12 important character decisions that will influence character background. I recommend choosing this option. These questions are kind of fun, and they have very specific advantages or disadvantages that they provide. I recommend, once again, going to uesp.net so you can look at what you can get for each of the answers to each of these questions. After the College of Destruction, what school of magic have you been studying the second longest? Okay, this is kind of a tough choice in a way. I'm a little tempted to just go with Restoration. Uh, but my character will already be getting a significant boost in Restoration due to its being a major skill. So I'm going to say, in terms of study, my character has studied mysticism quite a lot. What motivates you into a life of adventure? Riches, knowledge, helping others, fame, or fun? Well, for my character, helping others. This will increase my reputation among the common folk. In between formal study, you spent your time socializing with aristocrats, practicing acrobatics, swimming, learning street smarts, learning economics, or sparring. Depending on what you choose here, it can affect certain skills as well as increasing or decreasing reputation with certain types of people. I'm a little tempted to go with practicing acrobatics, but uh, I also kind of like the idea of starting out with um, a slightly above average swimming skill. So let's go with that. Since childhood, you have saved 100 gold pieces, a cuirass, a favorite book, or a katana. Now a katana is very tempting, but uh, I believe I will already have a long sword when I'm starting out, but I may not have any armor. I'm going to say that I saved a cuirass. In gratitude for services rendered, the Emperor gave you over 200 gold pieces, a book, a silver staff, an ebony dagger, a ruby, or an amulet. Now, first of all, pretty cool that my character will be getting a gift from the Emperor, huh? And we'll see a little bit more in terms of the background behind this uh, in a couple minutes. But uh, what should you choose here? Most players will tell you, you should go with the Ebony Dagger. Now, Silver Staff might not be too bad of an option if you do want to focus on blunt weapons. Uh, in both cases, they're made of a special material. Ebony is even more special than Silver, however. And in any case, you do want some kind of special weapon, ideally, when dealing with the initial dungeon, because there are two imps that you're likely to run across. 
and imps cannot be harmed with anything below silver, I think. I think silver is good enough. Ebony is definitely good enough to harm them. Now, if you don't have any weapon with a special material, you can choose to just run past them and not engage with them at all. You know, uh, you don't have to fight everything you see. But anyway, I definitely want to go with an ebony dagger, especially since my character does like to use long and short blades. As you grew older, you received additional magical training in destruction, illusion, thaumaturgy, restoration, alteration, or mysticism. Again, I consider this kind of a tough call. I'm going to go ahead and say thaumaturgy. You spend any free time you have training with short-bladed weapons, axe fighting, archery, hand-to-hand -hand combat, blunt weapons, or long blade. Now, long blade would seem like a natural choice, but I'm going to interpret this as free time aside from my uh, standard activities. And training in long blade is just one of my character's very standard activities. So we're going to go with short blade, and this is largely because I also want to increase my short bladed skill a little bit more to make sure I can get the best use out of that ebony dagger. You are friendlier than most with the Savage Harpies, the Glorious Dragons, the Infernal Daedra, definitely not, the Primitive Centaurs, the Simple Giants, the Immodest Nymphs, the Bucolic Spriggans, or the Mischievous Imps. So here we're talking about those language skills that I mentioned earlier, and I think it will be fun for my character to have a little bit of extra knowledge of the language of the giants of his region. Of all disagreeable types, you have the most personal hatred for sanctimonious priests, stupid peasants, immoral assassins, diabolic wizards, or power-mad robber barons. For my character, I'm going to go with power-mad robber barons. You are intimate friends with a monk, a rogue, an assassin, a warrior, or a mage. I believe this has no effect on the game whatsoever, uh, which was probably an error on their part. They probably meant for it to have some kind of effect. But anyway, I'll go ahead and choose a monk. What god, if any, do you worship? My character worships RK, birth and death god, and I'll have more to say about that later, but I definitely plan on my character joining the Order of RK, a god that is also sometimes named Tuwaka among the Redguard people in more recent additions to Elder Scrolls lore. You have the most trouble resisting poisons, getting along with others, resisting magic, staying awake and alert, avoiding diseases, fighting without magic. Now, we've already given my character a little bit of a low resistance to poison, so in this case I'm going to choose avoiding diseases. Your reputation have changed as follows. So everything's unchanged except for commoners, where I have a higher reputation now. Name thyself. Now, some of you are going to find this amusing, but I have decided to give my character a first name that is very famous for a certain distant relative he has of the same name who in a couple decades from the time of this game will be living in a certain city of Skyrim. That name is Nazim. My character also has a surname, al -Ashabah, and I'll have more to say about that later. Choose thy face. This is the one I want, but uh, just in case you're curious, we can browse through some of the other faces they have available. These have been upgraded, or if you don't like them, you could consider some of them downgrades <laughs> as compared to the original, more pixelated faces of the original Daggerfall. Anyway, in uh, this version of the game, this is the face I prefer most for my character. So we'll go with this. Now we're adding bonus points. It has added to each of my attributes according to random die rolls, and also give me a random amount of bonus points to add. I think we can do a bit better than this, so let's re-roll. This is looking pretty good. Yeah, some of these have gotten pretty high at 60 or very close to 60, and we have 13 additional points we can distribute. I think this is looking pretty great. I like to have high agility. Having 60 gives us a bonus to hit. I believe this also gives us a bonus to avoiding getting hit. For endurance, I want this to be 60 so we get a bonus plus one to our hit points with each level up and a plus one to our healing rate. Speed, let's go ahead and make that 60. Speed can be very helpful in combat. 
luck can affect everything a little bit. I'll add at least one more point there. Willpower. Intelligence. Yeah, let's go ahead and have willpower 55 and luck 55. That is looking beautiful, if you ask me. Now, I have kind of neglected personality, I guess. I think that's probably okay. I feel like my character, though they do have decent charisma, a decent personality, that hasn't been like a major focus of their life. They're not like the type of person who has ambitions of becoming a diplomat. So let's go ahead and stick with this. Now we can add some bonus points to our skills. Long blade, dodging, critical strike. Let's go ahead and put two more into long blade. Restoration, archery, and stealth. Sure. Mysticism, illusion. Okay, this is a little bit tough. But let's add a few more into short blade. In fact, yes, let's put those two points in short blade as well. Player reflexes determine the overall speed of the game. If you pick very high reflexes, the monsters will move and attack quickly, forcing you to be quick with the controls. Very low reflexes means the monsters will move and attack slowly, allowing you to adopt a more cautious, thoughtful playstyle. Your character will advance a little slower with a lower reflex setting, and will advance a little faster with a higher reflex setting. Back when I played original Daggerfall, I tended to keep this at average. I have heard a lot of people recommend playing this game with very high reflexes. They say it really doesn't make it that much harder. So I'm going to trust them as that will allow us to level up a little bit faster as well. This is our final chance to change anything if we've made any mistakes or had second thoughts about anything. I'm feeling very good about all of this. So let's get started. Four hundred years after Tiber Septim's reign, the beginning will meet the end and the bloody circle will close at the Empire of Tamriel. The unworthy heirs of the Septim dynasty have allowed the bonds of the Empire to weaken and crack. Uriel Septim VII cannot repair what his ancestors ignored. The provinces fight among themselves like neglected children, drunk with rebellion. One indomitable power hides itself, but not forever. Excuse the gloom, but none may know of this meeting. The nature of my trouble is darker still. Over a year ago, King Lysandus of Daggerfall died honorably on the field of battle. He was as loyal a subject, ally, and friend as you are. I did grieve for him, but his spirit does not rest. With a spectral army, he haunts his former kingdom, crying for revenge. I do not know why a good and loyal man would be so cursed. Perhaps you can find the answer and close the marble jaws of oblivion, bringing peace to his soul. I ask this as your emperor. And your friend. I have one lesser request. Several years ago, I wrote a letter to the Queen of Daggerfall. It never arrived. The letter was of a sentimental and personal nature. If you find and destroy that letter, I will be grateful. Now, my champion, rest well this night, for tomorrow you sail for the kingdom of Daggerfall.
Okay, quite an intro, wasn't it? Now you wake and look around the room. Some hours ago, you were in a boat en route to Daggerfall when a storm of supernatural strength boiled over the Iliac Bay like a malefic creature. Your boat was destroyed, but you managed to swim through the churning water to a promontory rock. There you found a cave and escaped the fury of the storm. You had only just lit a small fire when a mudslide sealed you within. Your fear of being buried alive calmed when you saw the corridor leading out of the cavern. Perhaps there is a way out of this cave after all. Once free of the cave, you can begin the Emperor's quest. The Elder Scrolls Daggerfall has a tutorial that can be active during the game. It runs throughout this first dungeon and for a short time afterward. Do you want to use this tutorial? I'm going to say no because I've already experienced it and I know what it's going to talk about. Okay, first things first, let's save our game. Now let's go ahead and suit up. Oops. <laughs> Got our iron cuirass we've kept from childhood. What else do we have here? An ebony dagger, iron short sword, iron long sword. You see here we have different options. We, uh, we don't have a wagon currently, so we can't select that, but we can uh, look at info for these different weapons. Now in Daggerfall Unity, they do provide this option to have all the info provided in kind of small text down here, and uh, so that's pretty handy. Anyway, let's go ahead and equip the Iron Longsword and the Ebony Dagger. You can equip two weapons at once. You can't actually dual wield, but equipping two weapons means you can switch between them with the click of a button. There is a slight delay, however. Um, let's go ahead and look at our magic items. We have a spell book. Ah, we have some torches and candles. We do want to go ahead and light a torch. That's something that typically isn't necessary, but because of some of the mods we have installed, uh, having a personal light source can be pretty important. And here we go. Let's take a look around. We do have some impressive looking 3D models here. There are going to be some objects that are still 2D sprites, however, such as these skulls. So that can be a little bit amusing sometimes. You can see how they kind of twist and turn, <laughs> depending on the angle you're viewing them from. Um, but to me, that's no big deal. I think that's part of the kind of retro charm of this game. You can see there's impressive uh, shadow effects and other lighting effects. Let's go ahead and see what's through this door. Ah, we have a rat, our first enemy. Bring it on, rat. Now the combat in this game is similar to the Elder Scrolls 1 Arena. By default, anyway, you have to uh, hold the right mouse button and then swing the mouse around as if it were your weapon. Occasionally you might get this issue where some of the uh, 3D models I have with my, uh, uh, I think it's called the, uh, let, me, let me look at this, what is it called? Uh, hand-painted models. With the hand-painted models mod, um, you know, it does make things look a lot better, but uh, Occasionally you look at this issue of, of uh, models being a little bit lower than they should be. Anyway, got 61 gold pieces and some red flowers. Interesting. So those flowers will show up here under ingredients. Let's go ahead and take a quick rest. Even though we didn't need it too much. Also get in the habit of quick saving. And I'm going to say more about my character's background later on, but uh, I don't want to bore you with too many of those details right now, simply because I've been doing a lot of talking during character creation. I figure you want to go ahead and see more of the actual game. Now I believe we might be facing our first imp here pretty soon. Oh, I also see a bat. I think the bat and the imp might be fighting each other. Enemies fighting each other is a Daggerfall Unity feature. It was not in the original game. And some people don't like it because they think it perhaps makes things... 
makes things easier, they don't like that. It, it does technically make things a little bit easier, since of course some of the enemies might kill some of uh, the other enemies for you. Um, and by the way, that does depend on what sort of group they're considered to be part of. But uh, I don't consider it a big deal. This game is already challenging enough. I don't mind uh, something like that, making things, on the one hand, more realistic, and also slightly easier. That's perfectly fine with me. Let's go ahead and sneak. I've installed a mod that combines crouching and sneaking, just because I'm used to that. In the original game, crouching and sneaking were technically separate keys. But I like having them combined, just because that's kind of how I'm used to having a visual signal of the fact that I'm sneaking. Though I stated earlier, technically your sneak skill is applied even when you're not making a conscious effort to sneak around. But uh, I'm not sure what's going on. I think the bat. <laughs> I think this bat is fighting an imp, but let's go ahead and uh, help the bat to die. And then we'll face the imp which will require our other weapon. Because this mundane longsword will not be able to harm the imp. Wow. We're having trouble harming this bat, too. What is going on? I almost feel like I'm seeing some buggy behavior. It was kind of... Ooh. Okay, now we got our ebony dagger equipped. The imp just died? Wow. So the bat just killed the imp somehow. When we saw that text that said save versus spell made, that was actually referring to the bat resisting the spell. Come on, there we go. The imp has some gold on it. Let's see what else there is to see. Here's some gold, a steel flail, I guess we'll carry that for now. A chain helm, so we probably can't equip that. Your class prohibits you from equipping this, yep. But that's okay, we might be able to sell that. In this game, sometimes you have no idea what objects might uh, trigger something, such as a secret door opening, or a trap springing that kills you, so you have to be careful. You really do want to save early, save often in multiple slots. And let's go ahead and try to rest again until fully healed. Your stealth skill has improved. Nice. So skills do not technically improve until you've spent some time resting after using them. Let's take a peek in here. Hello, rat. We are crouched down at your level and we are ready to fight. Wow. Okay. So this initial dungeon is relatively simple, so you know, I'm, I'm already pretty sure that touching any of these things isn't really going to do much of anything. Uh, but you never know. And I'm not an absolute expert on this game. There are a lot of people who know more about it than I do, uh, but I do have a fair amount of experience and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more of it and uh, actually doing a full playthrough this time. Oh! We've got ourselves a rogue, I believe. A thief, something like that. Come on. There we go, thief died. 19 gold. A steel longsword. So let's see, 2 to 16 damage. So yeah. A little better than the iron longsword we had. Chain round shield. Despite being chained, we can use that since it's a shield for some reason. Um, I mean, it's a little bit odd to call it shield chain anyway, so I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Anyway, an iron helm. We can equip that. Nice. There we go. Okay. So, our sword singer is looking a bit better equipped now. Oh my! <laughs> Got some lovely, lovely decapitated heads there. Um, let's go ahead and rest again. And 
save again. Nazim 2. are a little hard to kill, presumably because they're so agile. And I believe this character is technically an archer, if I remember correctly. Yes, there we go. What have we got here? Chain helm, some leather armor, silver boots. Nice. I believe silver also slightly increases disease resistance. Um, Couple more things. Don't want to get too weighed down. And let's see what else we can find. Right through here is one of the more interesting rooms in this first dungeon. A very large hall with a grand staircase. And there's a throne up there. There is a switch next to the throne. That's one of the tricks that some people don't realize initially that um, but you should be able to find it with just you know a little bit of looking around you should be able to see there's a switch there that will actually raise the platform the throne is on so you can get up to another area there's other ways of getting up there too in fact we're going to uh, use one of those other ways here potentially can't rest because there's enemies nearby there may be secret doors around here somewhere. Oh, well, here's just a normal door. <laughs> I just hadn't noticed that yet. And... Let's see what we can find up here. Sounds like a bear might be nearby. Quick save again. What do we have in here? Hello! Griffin's Feather. Steel Left Pauldron. Nice. Chain Right Pauldron. Well. In the casket we have a skeleton, a little bit of gold, some dragon scales, and a werebore's tusk. Nice. Giant Pat just died. Oh my. We have enemies fighting each other nearby. I better find a place to rest. Wonder if I can rest here. Nope. Not yeah, in here. Ah, we've leveled up. Excellent, excellent. So, we have some tough choices. I think I'll raise the endurance a little bit. And we'll call it good there. Long blade skill has improved. Let's rest a little more. Save again. Nazim 3. Now I mentioned that my character has an interesting surname, Al Ashaba. The Ashaba are a tribe of Red Guards. Ashaba roughly translates to the unclean. They are considered unclean because they, unlike most Red Guards, they are willing to engage with and, when necessary, fight undead. And that's something that is generally taboo among the Red Guard, at least according to more recent lore. I think this is lore that did not exist at the time of Daggerfall, 
In fact, I think it was just developed for The Elder Scrolls Online. Nonetheless, I think it's kind of cool. And um, I like the idea of my character having at least some family ties to the Ashaba tribe. And so he's had some training in how to effectively fight undead and deal with undead in, in various ways. And that may also help explain why the Emperor would especially trust me with dealing with the uh, ghost of Lysandus that has been haunting the city of Daggerfall. Oh my, we have an imp. I should have rested. Why? Oh, shoot. I forgot I had uh, put on a shield so I can no longer switch weapons with that one click. Let's get this ebony dagger going and hopefully take this guy down. Nope. That was weird. Okay. We got him. That was a bit risky. Our health is quite low now. Um, hopefully our rest won't be interrupted. Great. Let's go back to Steel Longsword. And continue. We have a strange circle of skulls mounted with candles here. And if we click on this, I believe that will open some of those bookcases over there. Yep. Giving us access to this treasure. Another one there. Oh, come on. Is there more? Oh, there we go. A potion recipe. Red berries, thicker, and lodestone. Sure, let's remove that and the steel flail. Fine. We are not over encumbered yet. We'll see how long that lasts. By the way, there is a map. The 3D mapping is uh, improved in Daggerfall Unity. Nonetheless, it can still be a little bit confusing until you get used to it. You know, uh, these 3D maps are, of course, more complex than the. Um, than the 2D maps that you get in the Elder Scrolls 1 arena. And, and they're more complex, frankly, than a lot of the later Elder Scrolls games. But, uh, but hey, they're not, they're not too bad. You know, once you get used to how to rotate this thing around, uh, you can get a good feel for how to, how to navigate well. It also tries to mark not only your current location, but uh, when relevant, it tries to mark the location of the entrance that you came in from. Anyway. I wonder if there are any secret doors here. I actually don't recall if in this game secret doors are revealed on the map like they are in Arena. They might be to some extent, but uh, anyway. I think that's just an empty room. Let's proceed through here. Ah, see, now we are up. Above that hall we were looking into earlier. And we have a skeleton wandering around. Those skeletons can be tough. There's the throne I mentioned. So let's go ahead and take advantage of that switch by the throne. Let's go ahead and run to this platform. And Skeleton, we are not going to fight you. We're just going to move on. And in fact, I don't feel a need to thoroughly explore every inch of this first dungeon. I want to go ahead and get out into the main world and uh, just move forward with the game, especially because Skeletons and certain other enemies here really can be tough, you know, we you know, And we're, we're a bit weakened by our recent experiences, you know, the shipwreck and swimming to the shore and everything else uh, So we're not in a good state to be facing 
tough enemies. So, let's take a look in here. There's the exit. And there's an imp. Let's go ahead and take this imp out. If you don't want to fight the imp, you could of course just make a run for the exit, but I think we can take him. Do a quick save. Hello there. <laughs> okay. I don't know if my character is having good luck or if those imps just aren't as tough as I remember them being, but uh, we've been taking them down fairly easily in this game. Anyway, so we have some creepy altars and whatnot. There is more to explore if we really wanted to, but like I said, I think we're going to go ahead and just exit. I'm going to save just in case. And here we are, in the outside world. Let's go back to equipping our steel sword. We have some nice ambient music and sound effects and, uh, you know, as long as you're willing to overlook the occasional <laughs> odd effects from some of these uh, 2D tree sprites. The visuals in this game are actually very striking. I love that we can see the distant terrain. I do have a distant terrain mod installed. And anyway, here is the little entrance to that underground place called Privateer's Hold that we just came out of. Now one thing I want to do just for fun before we're done today is I want to show you how in this game, unlike Arena, you can choose to just manually travel from one location to another instead of using fast travel. Um, now I'm going to bring up the uh, fast travel map right now. We're currently in the Daggerfall region. Daggerfall um, County, I guess you could say. We can zoom in here and all these little dots are little locations of interest. You know, some of them are dungeons, some of them are temples, some are homes, some are towns or cities. And if you forget where you're located, you can click on I'm at. So that's where we are right now. We are right at the location of Privateer's Hold. Now, if we were to go south just a little bit, we could get to Gothway Garden, which is a tiny town. So we're going to do that just for fun. Um, but uh, our next major destination will be Daggerfall. And uh, we could just fast travel there by clicking find and we could just type dag and then that'll bring up a list of possible locations we may want to travel to, and uh, we could double click on that. It's a little bit far away, but well, we're going to say no, we don't want to travel there right now. Let's exit. Now before we start walking, I do want to take a look at one more thing. Our character has a history here. When you click on history, you do also see um, your advantages and disadvantages that you may have selected for your custom class. And then it moves on to this. This is auto-generated based on our, uh, you know, various aspects of the, the character we created and the way that we answer some of those questions that we received. Um, and it's possible I might decide to ignore some of this uh, supposed history of my character, but we'll see. Let's take a look. Your earliest memories of your home life are of an ongoing turmoil. Visitors continually arriving and leaving, and your mother and father at separate times also having to leave for extended periods. As you grew older, you realized that your mother was a member of an elite mercenary legion, first as a weapons instructor, and then later as a combat tactical expert. Your father's interests were quite different. He was a well-respected member of the local mages guild, and a master of all kinds of magic. He found you an apt pupil and soon you were able to perceive the more subtle energies of other worlds. You remember your parents talking about the Imperial Battle Mage, Jagar Tharn, how it was known in their circle that he had usurped the power of the land away from its rightful ruler. So this is referring to the story of the Elder Scrolls I Arena, uh, which took place uh, not long before this game. No one dared to move against him. You secretly found Tharn and his cruelty nauseating. One day in your 20th year, you received a visitor at your house with the news that a powerful hero had killed Jagartharn and restored the exiled emperor to the throne. 
The visitor also brought the news that there would be a great celebration in Imperial City. Once the courier left, you asked your parents if you could go to the celebration. Your mother and father discussed it for some time before deciding that it was time you made your own way in the world. Your mother gave you a cuirass and your father gave you a very unusual staff. Then you were sent on your way to the Imperial City and the celebration. After many days of travel, you approached the capital of the realm, the Imperial City. You notice a small band of travelers only a short distance in front of you. As you join them, you are attacked by brigands who have been lying in wait in the woods along the road. One of the brigands raised his short sword to strike you. In a natural reflex, you try to deflect the blow with the staff your father gave you. As the sword struck the staff, a great bolt of lightning erupted from it and both weapons shattered. The brigands and the travelers all stopped and stared at you. As the thunder subsided, the brigands ran back into the woods. You were mobbed by the travelers who thanked you profusely for saving them. They told you they were members of the Imperial family who have been visiting in the country and were returning to the Imperial city for the celebrations. They insisted that you come with them to the palace and have an audience with the Emperor. The Emperor was very impressed by your bravery and grateful to you for saving his family. He formally invited you to the celebration and presented you with an ebony dagger. The festival continued for weeks and during that time, the Emperor often called on you for informal talks. When you were not in audience, you usually spent your time swimming in the murky black waters of the Caledon River. One night you were called to the Emperor's presence in a manner such that you knew the business was serious. He met you in his study and there told you he had a favor to ask. So that's where we had the, um, uh, the intro video that we saw earlier. And anyway, this helps explain why our character would have any kind of relationship with the Emperor. Um, he's very lucky in that respect. And at the same time, he also has some onerous duties that he must now deal with, that he's been tasked with by the Emperor. And, uh, but he, he doesn't mind that. He takes that very seriously. He's grateful to have um, important and worthwhile duties to perform. We have a log here that uh, includes our active quests. I am on a mission from the Emperor to investigate the shade of King Lysandus. His spirit has been haunting the city of Daggerfall. The Emperor himself has charged me with the duty of laying his ghost to rest. There is also the minor matter of a letter he sent to the Queen of Daggerfall. If I should find out what happened to the letter, he would be most appreciative. Before landing in Daggerfall, a sudden storm capsized the ship. I barely made it into this cave. So, I think that's enough of that for now. But again, our background as a sword singer and as one who has received training from the Ashabah tribe will serve us well throughout this game. Now, let's go ahead and start traveling south. Hopefully it won't take too long. And unless you've installed certain mods, it's relatively rare to be interrupted by enemies out here in the wilds. But it does happen on occasion, and uh, it can especially happen when you rest. If we rested right now, I bet we would be interrupted by a, a bat. But other things are possible, such as a wandering centaur or other interesting enemies. So we're just traveling straight south, as you can see from the compass in the lower right-hand corner. Generally speaking, you probably won't want to manually travel from one location to another because it does take a while, but I wanted to at least demonstrate that it is possible. And this is kind of the... Uh... This is kind of the simplest example of that because I believe on that travel map this location was just one one pixel more or less <laughs> below where uh, where, maybe I shouldn't say pixel, but you know, one square below the square where the privateer's hold was. And here we are, we've made it. Because it was relatively close, that didn't take too long. But generally speaking, when you're looking at this travel map, usually locations are not right next to each other. So, you know, if you tried to walk here to Moorheart Orchard, you could do it. It would take, you know, two or three times as long as what we just did. So again, it, it can, perhaps be a bit tiresome. Depends on what mood you're in, uh, or how you want to roleplay your character. 
but fast traveling is really perfectly fine. You know, that, that's a perfectly fine way to, to roleplay your character. And, um, but if you really want to see all the scenery on the way, but cut down on the travel time, uh, there are, are mods that can help with that. So at this point, let's go ahead and change to info mode. We see the rat and helm. That's an inn where we could spend the night if we wish. We have some residences. Let's go ahead and spend the night here. And then that'll be it for today's video. The Rat and Helm, not the most ideal name for an inn in my opinion, but uh, who am I to say? We see Andictor Copperheart, Tristric Masterham, and Morgan Coppersley. Excellent. Let's go into dialogue mode or grab mode, either way will allow you to talk to people. And we could discuss... Oh, we don't have time for my type? Wow. It's a little bit rude. Well, can I get some food and drink? After everything I just dealt with, um, I think I could use... Um, oh. Let's say I don't have much appetite, but I want something to calm my stomach. Let's just get some broth. And a room. For one day. Enough bargaining. My price is four gold pieces. Take it or leave it. Sure. Goodbye. There are enemies nearby, it says. Why are there enemies nearby? That is bizarre that it's claiming there are enemies nearby. Okay, now we can rest. Sometimes mysterious things happen in this game. Um, anyway, like I said, I think uh, we'll probably call it good here. Um, if I think of anything else to add in terms of my character concept or the lore behind it and whatnot. Uh, whoa. Ah. So there's a rat following me around for some reason. Okay. Goodbye, rat. Anyway, if I think of more stuff I want to share next time, then, uh, you know, uh, we can uh, discuss that uh, in my next video. And if you have anything you want to add or questions you have about this game or my character concept or um, Daggerfall Unity, anything whatsoever, please do leave a comment down below. Uh, please also like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe to see more, and consider supporting me on Patreon where you can also gain access to my upcoming games through uh, my little mostly one-man studio, Golden Drake Linux, or sorry, Golden Drake Studios. Golden Drake Linux is actually the name of a Arch installer designed for gamers and game developers that I created as part of my work uh, in Golden Drake Studios. Uh, but I'm also slowly but surely working on some games that you can gain access to uh, as a Patreon supporter. And in any case, uh, whether you can support me or not, thank you so much for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time.